Good morning. Thank you all for coming. I've said to several of the people who are organizing this that I have no idea what I'm going to say until I actually get up and start saying it. So this is as much of a surprise to me as it will be to you. But I do understand that the topic or the theme for today is commitment. And believe me, if you spend 40 years making books by hand, if you're not committed to that, you're going to be committed somewhere else. So uh, I, I suppose that I'm right on topic from the start. Many times over the last many years, people have come to visit the press. And it's always interesting for us to hear what they say when they come and watch us working. Very often, the first thing they do is smell. They come in and go like this when they walk into the room. <clears throat> because, of course, there's the smell of ink and solvent and type and dust and you know everything else, dogs and uh, me. <clears throat> and the, um, the, the effect overall is that walking into a press room, any press room, is rather like walking into a kind of uh, magical cave. It always was for me, anyway. Although I knew nothing whatever about printing when Jan and I established the press. I should probably spend some time talking about the history, and I will, but two of the comments that have been made over the years by people who have come to visit us have particularly stuck in my mind. One was a woman who, having spent some time talking to us and looking around what we were doing, stood back and clasped her hands and said, it's like fairyland, it's a fairy tale. And another one was a man who, having asked a lot of questions, said, you know, this is like being in the middle of history. Now, both of these comments seem to be perfectly apt in their own way, if somewhat perhaps polar opposites from one another. And in fact, what has happened at the press and what I'm going to talk to you about today is, I think, part fairy tale and part history lesson, because what we do is founded on a craft which, although it's not terribly old in historical terms, it goes back to the 15th century, 14th century, 15th century, in Western Europe and North America. Uh, but it is, it has a surprisingly rich history, a surprisingly rich process. As you know, I'm sure you all know this, um, the first book was printed from movable type in Western Europe in what year? Does anyone know? Great. Well, very close, 1452, actually. Gutenberg's Bible, printed from movable type. It's not, as some people say, the first book ever printed from movable type in the world. Gutenberg didn't invent this process. It had already happened in China and Korea two or three hundred years before that but for various reasons never really was carried forward very much. Gutenberg, however, started printing in Western Europe and started the tradition of which we were a part. And his style, his methods, the kinds of press he used, the method of casting type and setting type and printing type, remained substantially unchanged for several hundred years afterwards. In fact, Really, the first huge change in the press that he used didn't come until the beginning of the 19th century when the iron hand press was developed. Up to that time, all the printing presses were made out of wood, as his was. They had slightly more sophisticated mechanisms, but that was really about the only difference. And in fact, printing, letterpress printing, as a main part of the printing process for every kind of printing that was done, books and advertisements and flyers and posters and everything else, really was the main process up until the middle of the, of the 20th century. 50 years ago, most cities still had letterpress shops running and running at a fair rate. They were doing a lot of work. A lot of newspapers in small towns were still printed letterpress in the 1950s. And when Jan and I started Barbarian Press in 1977 in England, and this is something which drives me crazy sometimes if I let it, we could have gone up to London with a big van and a lot of money and we could probably have outfitted the kind of press room we have within a couple of days of shopping. There were places where you could go to buy everything we use. I remember, for example, a shop called Printer's Pie, which is an expression used in letterpress for what happens when you spill a bunch of type on the floor and it gets all mixed up. It's called a Printer's Pie. There was a place called Printer's Pie where you could buy composing sticks, like this one down here in front of me, type, uh, setting rules, tweezers, special kinds of yarn for tying up type, everything you can imagine, available right then for sale. Within 10 years of that time, all those shops had disappeared because the beginnings of uh, offset type had really taken over and the beginnings of the digital revolution, of course, were starting by the 1990s. So all of that suddenly disappeared. Uh, over 500 years of 
technology and development and thought going into techniques vanished almost overnight. Now, where we live here in Vancouver, there are only two or three letterpress shops, only one, well, I think there are two or three that do some commercial work, one of which is well represented here this morning, in fact, by several of its employees, and one or two private presses like ours. And private presses are what I'm here to talk about, and particularly our own. Now, the private press, this is a phrase which has fallen a bit out of use. People tend to say fine press now rather than private press. But the private press was started as a, as a term and as an idea really in the 1880s and 90s by a man named William Morris. A private press is simply a press in which the entire operation, the ownership of the materials, the design of the whatever is printed, usually books, the editorial impulses, the publishing strategies, everything else, are in the hands of one or two or very few people. In our case, Barbarian Press consists of Jan and me, and occasional help that we can rope in, unsuspecting guests who suddenly find themselves in the press room distributing type for us and that kind of thing. Um, we tell them it's educational and they don't mind very much. So. <laughs> the, uh, the laugh you heard was from one of those people. <laughs> um, she, she, she knows whereof she laughs. Um, but when Jan and I started, Barbarian Press, and on January the 1st, 1977, we can put a, an actual date on it, we hadn't the remotest idea that we would end up doing what we have done for the last 40 years. It was very simple. It, it was an accident, really. I had written a poem, and we wanted to have it printed because it was written for someone's 50th wedding anniversary, and we needed to find a printer to print it. So a friend of ours who was an artist gave us a name. We got in touch. We met him on New Year's Day in the morning in a pub which is probably the reason I'm here today, because if he hadn't been rather hung over, I don't think he ever would have agreed to the situation <laughs> that we put in front of him. We had a very little bit of money, only 60 pounds, and we said, can you print this poem for 60 pounds? And he said, no. But he said, since I'm doing nothing but advertisements and cards for garages and so on, he said, I'm really bored, so I'll do it, but only if you help me. So we said, fine. We had no idea what we were getting into. Now we do. Uh, we walked out of the pub, up a little lane to his cottage, in which there was a press and some type and some paper, and he began to teach us about printing. The first thing we learned from Graham, Graham Williams was his name, he ran a press called the Florin Press, was a very fine printer. The first thing we learned from Graham was how to tear paper. Now even the notion that one had to learn how to tear paper was something that struck us as rather odd. But there is a way to do it, which is proper and right, especially if it's handmade paper, which is what we were dealing with. So he told us how to do that, and we learned that. And Jan sat in the kitchen tearing paper while Graham then showed me the type. And the type was, again, something that I was baffled by. A case about 30 inches by 20 inches with something over 80 little compartments in it, each one stuffed full with little pieces of metal type. I had no idea what the order of them was, but he told me. And the first thing I ever set was in six-point italic bedoni. Now, any of you who's ever handled type knows that six-point type is very bloody small. It's not easy at all. And even then, when my fingers were younger and more dexterous than they are, it was quite a chore. But I did it. I set the colophon for that first book. And in 10 days, the book was done. I learned an incredible amount, and so did Jan, through that 10-day ten ten period. And by the time we had finished, we decided that we did not, in fact, go to England to do PhDs at King's College London. We went to England to learn how to print and to start a private press. So in 76, we went there with fellowships to study for a PhD. And in 78, we came back to Vancouver with several presses on the way in, in large crates that were being posted back after us, two large oil paintings, four very loud cats, and no PhDs. <laughs> we found. After a lot of searching, we found a house where we now are, which we moved into 40 years ago, last October or next October? Last October. And we have been there ever since. Uh, we've built one new press room since we went there. The first press room was a shack. All of this is, it seems very glib to say this, that it just happened almost overnight. It didn't, of course. But we never wavered from our sense that this was exactly what we wanted to do. There was something about the serendipity of being introduced to the idea of being able to make books of texts that we loved in order to celebrate those texts, which has never left us. 
no matter the despair we often felt at uh, realizing that we were just about on the edge of the precipice financially, and that's happened very often, or when I've spilled a, a, a whole case of eight-point centaur type on the floor about two o'clock in the morning and burst into tears, or when we uh, came home one night and found the press room flooded and had to take the goats out of the goat house and tether them to the Albion press so that they at least were dry. Um, all of these things aside, the commitment to the press never wavered at all. And this brings me to one difference, I think, between our press and our work in it and many other presses, and that is that we came to printing from the point of view of literature. We were academics, or at least proto-academics. Uh, we were going to be, we were working in literature. I'm, of course, a writer. Jan's a writer. And we expected that we would spend our lives teaching in universities. And we had done a fair bit of that and, and did after this too. But our attitude toward what we did as printers was to celebrate texts. And that too has changed over the last 40 years considerably. When we began, it was quite common to find in most big cities, in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and certainly in San Francisco and LA and New York, all kinds of small presses like ours devoted to bringing out new poetry and new writing by new writers. This is a time-honored tradition in the private press. It's one of the things which the private press has been most importantly involved in over the last century or more. And at the time we were starting, we were able to do that. We published quite a bit of new poetry, new translations, which particularly interested us. But as time went by, and as letterpress equipment and type and everything else began to become more and more rare and more and more expensive, it became impossible for us to produce books of new poetry at a price which was reasonable for the, for the material. After all, if a new poet has just written his first book of poems or her first book of poems or short stories, wants to have it produced in a nice looking edition and we can't produce it for under two or three hundred dollars a copy, it does no service to that writing or really to the poet or, or to us. And the fact is that with the kind of time it takes to do what we do, those are problems which come up. So the commitment we have has been modified somewhat, not that we care less about doing those things, but that we realize they can be done better elsewhere, digitally, for example. Um, and we have instead increasingly turned to celebrating the canon, the canon of literature. As students of literature all our lives, and as people who grew up with uh, books of all sorts in both our, both our families, we both read a great deal, we were intent on a problem which we saw increasingly emerging, which was that many people who had studied literature in high school, as most of us are condemned to do one way or another, um, <laughs> And I say condemned because so often it's taught by people who are terrified of it. Have you noticed that? You know, <laughs> teachers stand up to teach Shakespeare and they look as if they're shell-shocked, as if they've been hit on the back of the head with a mallet, you know. And we were really aware of the fact that most people, when they leave high school, never reread some of these great works of literature which they're exposed to then as, as young people. When we have published things like Keats' The Eve of St. Agnes, or a book of Keats' Odes, or Shakespeare's Pericles, or Venus and Adonis, or any number of other canonical pieces of literature, among all the other things we do, we have, every time, we have had people write to us or phone us and say, you know, this Keats, this, this poem is really great. This guy knew what he was doing, you know? He said, I haven't read this since I was in high school. It's terrific. Do more. So we do. I mean, after all, we're, after all we're in business, we should do what we're told to do. Right? This kind of printing, this kind of design and, and, and publishing has become increasingly important to us. But along the way, another very important factor took over. When you're doing the kind of work we do, in fact, any kind of work that's associated with uh, the arts in the broadest possible sense, you meet other people who do other kinds of things. And among the people we met fairly early on were wood engravers. Now, wood engraving, how many people know what wood engraving is? Oh, good, good, good number, okay. Wood engraving is simply illustrations for books or prints made for, them, for their own sake on type-high blocks, that is, blocks of wood which are planed to the same height as a piece of type that you're printing, so they can be printed together. And they're engraved with very fine knives, scorpers and gouges and various other names, uh, to create images. If you come up afterwards and look at some of the books here, there are some wood engraved illustrations which we've printed and commissioned um, for the press. 
We discovered these in 1984 when we decided to print, uh, really I suppose the first canonical piece that we've, we had encountered. We decided to do Dickens' Christmas Carol. We always loved the book that we thought it'd be a great idea. But of course we also discovered that several private presses in the past had already done it. A friend of ours who was an academic, who had never had the sense to go into private press printing and had remained an <laughs> academic, um, specialized in 19th century drama. And he said, you know, when Dickens wrote these, these books of his, they were usually stolen because there was no copyright. They were usually stolen by these playwrights who used to put together a play and put it on of the book, sometimes even before the book was finished. So that the book, the play ends differently than the book does. It's very embarrassing for somebody. Anyway, Dickens was very, very popular, and so his plays, were, his books were stolen at random by all sorts of people. And Joel found uh, a particularly interesting version, dramatic version, of A Christmas Carol, and we printed that. It hadn't been in print since the 1850s, 1840s. Uh, and we, in order to give it some presence and some interest, we commissioned wood engravings from a woman named Edwina Ellis in England. This was the first time that we had certainly commissioned wood engravings, although we had seen and admired them, and the first time Jan had printed them. And I remember there was a, a CPC crew came up to film at the press when we were just putting this book in the press, and Jan was on camera by lucky accident when she pulled the first proof of one of these blocks. And as she lifted the tympan of the Albion Press and looked at the image that was there, this look of absolutely radiant joy came over her face and it was captured on camera. It's absolutely wonderful. And I watch her now in the press room printing wood engravings at the moment. We're printing a, the fifth in a series of books we do on individual engravers. And every once in a while that same look comes over her face because these blocks are magnificently produced by fine, fine artists. And Jan is recognized, I can say this, she never would. Jan is recognized as one of the best printers of wood engravers in the world. And wood engravers love to have her do their blocks. She usually finds things in the blocks that they never, they knew were there, but they never were able to get them out themselves. So it's a, it's a real treat for both the engravers and for Jan, and for everyone who looks at them, of course, to have that done. So wood engraving has become an important part of our production as well. We use wood engravings to illustrate most of our books because wood engravings are um, idiomatic with type. They're the same height, they use the same ink, and while Jan doesn't usually print them at the same time as she prints the text because uh, wood engravings need more ink than type does and one is liable to be over-inked or under-inked if you print them together, she nevertheless uses them often on the pages with type this book here will show you an example of that. And the balance, the comfortable kind of relationship between wood engraving and type is palpable on those pages. So this press, Barbarian Press, this creature which we made and which we've run together, has gone through its own little history of 40 years and will continue, I hope, for another, well, not another 40 given my age, but you know, for a good few years yet. We have some projects in mind and we have two large books in the press now. That's history, and being part of that history of the private press, the broad barbarian press's own history, and the history of letterpress printing is something which is a matter of great pride to us. I think that probably we have developed over the years a real sense of resonance in what we do. And when people come in and ask, as they often do, why do you do this this way? It's so slow. You could do it so much more quickly and do so many more books. The answer is that when you're pursuing a craft, you're not so much interested in the final result as you are in the process. The process of making a book, setting type, designing the page, doing the layouts, printing, all the rest of it, designing the bindings, that process is what keeps us going. That's what's really brilliant for us. It's lovely. And we we're very fond of the final books. We we're proud of them. We like to show them to people, and we enjoy people's pleasure in them. But when we finish a book, we're looking forward to the next one. We're not dwelling on that one for very much longer. I can only think of a few times when I've actually sat down and read one of our books after they've finished. Although, of course, having had set the whole thing, I know the text pretty well. Um, <clears throat> so that, the history part of it, the man who said this is like a history lesson, makes sense to us on all sorts of levels. But the lady who said this is like a fairy tale also makes a lot of sense to us. Because one of the elements maybe the key element of fairy tales, 
is enchantment. And enchantment, not a very popular word or favorable word these days perhaps, but enchantment is a quality which all of us look for. It comes from creativity, it comes from the joy of seeing things which are beautiful, it comes from nature, it comes from love for one another, and it comes from good work. And good work is the key, I think, both to commitment and to enchantment and to craft. Thank you very much. This is not, we could have easily done this as Jan and Crispin doing a talk. And of course getting, I'm amazed because uh, 20 minutes is a very short period of time to give a presentation and that's why I like this dialogic aspect of it. But uh, we could probably do a three hour workshop easily and talk endlessly about these things. Well, so, never shut up. Uh, <laughs> so if you guys hover near those microphones, um, I would like to give the audience a chance to ask either of you qu any questions relating to what we started uh, digging into here today. Sure. But my first question for you both is this. Your, your kind of the collision of creativity, which often is about trying thing, new things and new ways and solving problems and fighting chaos and what have you, and this notion of commitment. You have taken a stand to commit to some old world technologies, these, these these firmly entrenched ways of being, these beautiful things. Have you ever, and, I, and, and you know, I'm sure along the way you were introduced to many opportunities to adopt new stuff, but have you ever made it, have you ever found that your commitment to that path backfired? Or you had a regret that you didn't adopt some, some way of being? <laughs> no. No. <clears throat> no, but it's all right. There's a more complicated answer than that. Um, it's true that we've never regretted that. But we're also not Luddites. Uh, we don't feel that this is the only way things can be done and be beautiful, by any means. And <clears throat> there are a lot, I mean, for example, we sometimes use photopolymer plates, which are a new process to print from because they can be mounted and printed on a, the kind of press we use. Uh, in several of our books, which have used photographs, of course, we've had to have them printed out of house, so we've no problem with that. Uh, and there are a number of private presses in England, particularly, who feel the way we do about that. There's, one press, particularly the old school press, which, which does reproductions of watercolor prints from digital prints with archival ink on an Epson printer, and they're absolutely exquisite. Nobody could possibly object, you know. Although there are a few diehards who sort of mumble and grunt and pull their suspenders, you know. This kind of <laughs> <laughs> from my perspective as, as a printer, I mean, uh, there would be nothing for me to do if I weren't printing letterpress. I, I don't want to. I'm not putting it down in any way, but I don't want to push buttons and, and, and watch things flip through, right? So um, I love the relationship between me and the work that I'm doing and what comes up. And it's that really intimate relationship that gives me the drive to keep doing it. And I guess the thing I'm discovering as I get older in my late 60s now, that it gets physically harder and a little bit mentally harder, but sustaining that drive to make the first and the last print that I do equal is still the thing that I try to maintain. And it's not always easy, but I, you know, I need to do that because excellence has to be done. Amazing. <laughs> if you, if you uh, and I encourage you to do this, end up uh, able to um, engage in email co correspondence with, with Crispin and Jan, you'll notice when you get the emails, they're perfectly composed, <laughs> perfectly typeset, and the he, they use serif typefaces in their emails. Nobody uses serif typefaces in their emails anymore. Who has questions for our guest speaker back here? Here. In contrast to the theme of commitment that we're talking about today, like other creatives, have you ever had a moment of, I need to give up, or I want to give up? No, not one. No. <laughs> Alrighty, that's amazing. I, 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 did, I did say, I think at some point, that perhaps we should be committed, but, yeah. uh, but we, we have a commitment and that never occurred to us, no. I mean, there are times when I wish I could take a break because it's pretty much 
continuous because we can't afford not to keep working. Yeah. So, I mean, that would be as close as I would ever come to saying, I don't want to do this for a month or something, but never, never a moment's doubt that we're doing the right thing. The for idea us. of retiring is absurd. I mean, I don't know what we'd do. We could, I mean, yes, of course, we could eat and listen to music and enjoy one another's company and maybe travel a bit, but I'd always want to get back into the press room and set type and design a book. That's what I do. And the thing that, this isn't really your question, but I, one of the things that sustains us is the fact that we're doing this together. Yeah. It's, it's a great deal of work for one person to do. We do know some private presses that are essentially one person, but they don't generally do projects quite as big as we can do, is with as much text um, without you know, the editorial expertise that Crispin has. And, you know, we haven't just made books, we've made a life together. And um, there's never been a moment when it's been a strain on our relationship or, on it. I mean, it's not that our, <laughs> our marriage has always been perfect, but the working relationship and the fact that we're making things together has really sustained us all the way through the ups and downs that people have. And it's, it just kind of fell out Fortunately, that Crispin loves, does most of the designing, um, nearly all of it, and we collaborate on ideas for it and certainly the publishing part of it, but he sets the type and I print. And it wasn't something said, you know, where one of us said, you have to do this and I guess I'll do that. We just were naturally drawn to it. So that's another sort of serendipitous thing for us is that we fell into things individually that we both loved that we could do together. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Testing. I just want to say thank you for uh, being here. And uh, for us who work in software, I find that I had a, a recent experience working on a letterpress. There's something about the tactile nature of putting your hands on something and seeing the results of it, which is very powerful. Mm -hmm. And for those who are in this area, like I am, there's this website called WePress.ca, and it's a community-based uh, letterpress. So they have two machines there. It's right beside uh, between Army and Navy and uh, Pigeon Park. So any, it's a membership-driven letterpress uh, workspace, so anybody can go and give it a try. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Loved your presentation. You're Definitely a Shakespearean actor. It's, it was in there. It was definitely in there. There you go. Um, my question is, during that week after you met with the, your per, the friend at the pub, when during that week did you know that this is it? You guys are going to change your life to this direction? I can answer for me because I, I just okay, told yeah, you, ahead, you people down there, right? Um, Crispin described my sitting in the kitchen with a wood stove tearing the, making the fibers of the Henry paper just beautifully pull apart, it tearing it. it was, um, and that's such a um, contemplative and intimate sort of thing to do. And it was the first thing that I've been able to do with my hands. I mean, I'm not saying I'm a klutz, but I was an athlete and I was an academic and an intellectual, but I was not an artist in any way. Um, but I discovered my hands in that kitchen. And I thought, okay, for the first time, I can take what's here and here, th bring it through my hands, and there's something tangible in front of me that I can make. And that was it. I mean, I it was found something I didn't know I really needed. My think? response to that is slightly more obstreperous. <clears throat> Graham was about my size and about my hairiness. And uh, he and I, we had to work through the nights very often to get this thing finished. We only had 10 days to, to finish it. It's a bit like giving a talk at Creative Mornings. And um, in the middle of the night sometimes, I would be putting the paper in the press and Graham would be inking and pulling it. This is a hand press. And one or the other of us would start to drift off on our, uh, fall asleep on our feet and the other one would reach across and slap him in the face. <laughs> and it, I remember one time when Gra I felt this <laughs> across my face and I kind of came to and I thought, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard, heard you put it that way before. <laughs> Good morning, Crispin and Jan. I wonder, Martin, do you find any challenges these days in sourcing the various special materials you require to do what you do, papers, inks, fonts, etc.? Is it getting less and less and more difficult to find, to get stuff? Are paper makers? I know them, you know them. Are they still producing the paper of the quality you want? Are the inks up to your snuff? 
Well, you talk about paper, I'll talk about other things. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Well, there's nothing in North America that I can find that, that I want to use. So we get paper from, there are some handmade paper makers. Um, Saint Armand in Montreal is very good, but we don't often use handmade paper. It's expensive and much more expensive and more difficult to print on. We use, use it for specialized things. But we use, always use a, a nice quality mold made paper of rag content. And that comes from Europe and it's still being made, but there are smaller numbers of things, you know, less variety. Ink is, is my bugbear. I can't get really proper uh, letterpress ink. I've got some old cans from years ago that I'm sort of take a little bit of and use when I'm doing wood engravings. But yes, the, the sourcing things is, I mean, and if someone says you can print with water-based ink, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Uh, type is, of course, an issue. Um, when we started, as I said, you could walk into London and there were shops that had fonts of type on the shelves and you just bought them. Uh, fortunately, we have found, well, as many, most letterpress printers in North America have, uh, Michael and Winifred Bixler in Scaniatalis, New York, who have a type foundry. Michael has only the classic fonts, Bembo, Polyphilus, and Blado, Centaur, and so on. And he's a, he casts with very hard metal. He's an absolute joy. If it weren't for Michael, I don't know what we would be doing now because he's the only real source for good type now. There are, there are some private type foundries, rather in the sense that we're private press, but very often they, they can't produce in huge amounts because just of the nature of, of the problem for them. And very often, of course, their taste differs from ours. And I know that may sound snotty, and it's, it isn't. <laughs> it's just that there are so many typefaces and so many metal faces have been available. And particularly, I think, in North America, there's been a taste for rather self-evident or, or self-consciously effervescent typefaces, mostly, I think, coming from Fred Gowdy, whose types I admire, many of them. But there's a kind of, um, how do I say this politely? Um, there's a kind of American exuberance, which occasionally takes over the page with American design types. Not all of them, by any means, but some. And I find generally that the types from the English foundries, the monotype fonts generally, which are all based on classical fonts. I mean, Bembo and Polyphilus and Blado all come from, they're more or less copies of types that were used by Minutius in the 1490s. Garamond comes from the 17th century, Bodoni from the 18th, and so on. So these are types which have been time-tested and true, and they allow one to use type in a way which, as Robert Bringhurst says, such that type has a transparency, a statuesque transparency, so that you, you look through the type to the text, and the type doesn't get in the way. It's like good movie music. If you hear it, if you're paying attention to it, it's not doing its job. That's the way type should be. And Michael Bixler allows us to get those types. I, that over answered your question, I'm sorry. That's, that's, there's more of our three hour discussion. Okay, don't freak out at me, but we're going to, we're going to need to do, do one or two quick questions. I see two in my periphery. Can we bang those off? And then we have some business to take care of before we leave today, is that cool? So I'm gonna go here first and then back to you, is that good? Hi, Crispin. Just wanted to say your talk was was enchanting, so thank you very, very much. Um, I have a question about your poetry. Um, I'm just wondering if you could share maybe, I know it's a difficult question, but maybe some of the themes that you explore in your poetry or a bit about your work as a poet. What do I write about? <laughs> uh, to my surprise, when I published my first book, my only book so far, I was, in the reviews, was often referred to as a philosophical poet. I don't know why, because I've never studied philosophy in any formal way, but I suppose it just means that I'm thoughtful. <laughs> maybe there's a poem here that takes me about a minute and a half to read. Would that, should I read it? Yes, Would that maybe answer the question? Okay, yeah, right. So uh, j just very quick question. When you guys do print, uh, how big is a run? Like how many books do you print? Um, a run is usually 120 to 150, something like that. Um, and, well, we'll be, this year I'll be doing one big book of wood engravings, which will take me about eight to nine months to do, and so on. another one sort of in between, which will take us another whole year to do. Uh, the smaller books there can maybe six to seven months, something like that. Yeah, you have to stick with it, which is why our daughter has decided <laughs> she doesn't want to do books, but she likes printing letterpress, so it's okay. 
I? I'm ready. <laughs> I didn't plan this. It was Mark asked me if I had anything to read, or if I could recite anything, and I can never remember my own work. This is a poem called Tulips, from a group of poems about flowers, which is called Pastoral Catalogues. And since we're just past tulip time, you can remember them as I'm reading. A sentence is an occasion for thought and the evidence of it. These, the event of grace, to contemplate it. Fingers purse the hand of a child, play the cat's dancing spine, wrap the lover's nape, gather the waist to draw toward an end. Tulips, tulipani, are glass in air, clear a separation dividing from babble, discourse, from clutter, clarity. Chalice flower, the wine of rain is blessed in them, the inward grace is outward sign. We stand, look, break, the way blossoms break unusually youthful each spring in the heart along the streets where we walk, as their wondrous snow beggars our mouths to say it. And tulips range, we see through tattered air, best where they are loosed, to show that polity will make of freedom a serious grace from simple shape and color. They could be brittle, but they are not. They are not nearly enough, like love. Once a year, in plainest terms, tulips speak resource and simple plenty. Not bread, but better, nearly a grace, like love. That's true.